Would you pray with me as we open up God's word together this morning? Our Lord, Jesus, we turn our hearts and minds to you. May we hear from you and experience you today. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1977, millions of Americans enjoyed a particular movie that was shown on the big screen. George Lucas's Star Wars. Any fans out there? A few of you are willing. Yeah, I see. I saw some energy from the back. Don't worry, if you've been holding off showing the movie to your kids, this, there's no spoilers in this sermon, okay? But this movie really is a perfect description of the tension and the joy of what we love to experience when we watch something. In summary, a ragtag group of rebels stands up to the empire, the evil regime, and the hero, Luke Skywalker, moves towards trust against all odds and good triumphs over evil. It's not our favorite part of movies when it looks like it's not going to happen, when it looks like it's not possible, and yet it happens. It happens. Yeah, this was supposed to be last Sabbath, so I looked at your feeds and your social media, and many of you, though it's not a national holiday, you celebrated May 4th, and I loved watching the t-shirts and the ties and the scrubs that you brought out for May the 4th. It was fun to get to see some of what you had, and even in our kids' schools, they were doing crafts with different Star Wars characters, but this, this movie and subsequent movies in the trilogy have the same tension. The future is bleak for the good guys, and yet one glimmer of hope remains. And like all good stories, good stories depend on conflict. When everything seems to be going well, then everything starts to fall apart. We know there's going to be a good story arc. That's what we find happens in our own lives too, but we like it less when it's happening to us. Isn't it true? <laughs> Conflict, challenge, struggle, when good triumphs and then everything's going well, what we often say to each other is, oh no, I wonder how long this will last. When will evil start to gain a foothold? When will something surprising happen? When will struggle come back? In this series on the book of Ezra, we looked first, the very first week in Ezra chapter 1 and 2, that God gave this tremendous and sweeping vision to the people of God, that God sets them free and gives them what they need to fulfill that vision. And we remember together that whatever God calls you to, God gives you the means to accomplish it. Can you say that one with me one more time? Whatever God calls you to, God gives you the means to accomplish it. Then we turn to Ezra chapter 3, and we found the people were there, but they were terrified. They were afraid, but they still took the step forward in the vision God had called them to, that they were invited to step out with that one next faithful step. The scripture says that they built an altar of praise even as they were afraid. So you can remember from that second part, despite my fear, I'll build an altar of praise right here. Could you say it with me again? Despite my fear, I'll build an altar of praise right here. It's that next faithful step that even when you're afraid, when you see the whole vision, you take that first faithful step. So the people work hard. They lay the foundations, they sing praise to God and the song of God's faithfulness and everything was going according to plan. But like every good story, like every good life, conflict enters the scene. When we get to Ezra chapter four, we see that the people of God face opposition. And that's what I want us to focus on today. Wherever there is vision, you can plan on opposition. Say it with me, wherever there is vision, you can plan on opposition. 
If you have a vision for your family and you believe God has given it to you and you want to be connected in love with each other and serving the world with love, you can plan that adversity and trial and struggle will come to your family. If you have a vision to get close to Jesus, to spend time with Jesus every morning, you can plan that scheduling conflicts and emergencies and crises will come right at the time when you have set aside to be with Jesus. If you have a vision for a degree, for a career that's going to allow you to serve others, you can plan that right there is going to be those trials, those roadblocks that will make you want to give up on what you feel called to. If you desire to impact people for the kingdom, Burnout will come at some point knocking on your door. If you desire to call on God and the, to live out the calling that God has spoken over your life, there will be days when you wonder if it will ever be a reality because wherever there is vision, you can plan on opposition. Vision given by God meets resistance from the enemy. That's what the people of God found to be true. Ezra chapter 4, you can turn there with me. Ezra chapter 4, starting in verse 1. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the whole time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered them, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and to make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Notice what happens to the people. The people of the land come to ask the people of God for help, to ask if they could lend a hand. These people worship God, but 2 Kings 17 tells us they didn't worship God exclusively. God was right alongside all the other gods. The God of Israel was not worshipped alone. So though it seems like an innocent gesture, they are seeking to infiltrate the ranks and stop progress towards the vision, diluting the focus that the people of God have. There's also, of course, the political pressure that they're facing, the situation of fear and trauma that they were in. These people had just been exiles. They were in this situation and now were set free and they're still finding themselves fearful and traumatized as they walk through. Would King Cyrus penalize them if they allowed others to help? What would be the ramifications of this choice? We're reminded here that traumatized people traumatize. We don't know fully what caused their fear, but we know that they were in fear. I wonder, just wonder what it would have looked like if, if they had made an appeal to the people who came to them. These people that were clearly, we know from the next verses, not seeking the best interest of the people or the temple. I wonder if they had made an appeal to them and said, come worship our God exclusively. Come see who God is. Open your heart to worship. I wonder if they would have followed the true God. We don't know. It's not what they did. They just said no. The people of God were passionate to get it right. But it seems again and again the people were seeking to pour out their energy, pour out all that they had, but they forgot their calling. They focused on being genealogically pure in the book of Ezra. They focused on the number of bowls. They had a, a count of how much money. And these things captured their focus instead of what God had called them to as the people of God. They missed the point of the holy people, the temple of praise that God was building. God called God's people to encompass, to spread, to bless, to make the whole world aware that they were children of the living God. So you can have your bowl count, but you can miss your true foundation of your faith. You can do all the things at the altar but still be afraid of your neighbors. Here's where the people of God were. 
Verse four and five does confirm their skepticism because perhaps, was, was it a self-fulfilling prophecy? But when the people of the land couldn't join the work, they moved on to the next part of their plan. Discourage the people of Judah. If you translate this literally, it says to weaken their hands. They're seeking to frustrate the work that God had called the people to, to distract them from the vision, to get them pulled off the right path. Have you ever encountered that in your life? That something came along to frustrate your efforts and your focus and your energy? Unfortunately, verse five says that they were successful. They were able to block the rebuilding of the temple of God. And for 16 years, history tells us. For 16 years, there was only an altar and a foundation and nothing more. For 16 years, the vision that God had given them, the sweeping vision and the provision God had given them to accomplish that vision just sat. Think about that for a moment. Those who came to distract and frustrate and disturb the vision were able to do so for 16 years. It's important to remember this when we get discouraged. It's important to remember when we feel like we're pulled off course that the enemy wants to frustrate you and discourage you. The enemy wants badly for you to lose sight of the vision that God has spoken over your life, over your family, over your call. He wants nothing more than to pause progress towards the vision God has given you. Their struggle wasn't against the people around them. Ephesians chapter 6 says it this way, Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says what captures their experience and our own, that we don't just struggle with the people around us. Your struggle is not against your coworker or your family member or even yourself. Your struggle is against the enemy who would seek to pull you off course, to pull you away from the vision God has for you. There's more going on. In our understanding as Seventh-day Adventists, we call this the great controversy. This is the great struggle, the war, the tension, that good and evil are at war with one another, and that there is an enemy. So when you feel discouraged, when you feel like, oh, it's not making a difference, it doesn't matter, is that from God or is that from another source? That's the enemy seeking to pull you from the vision God has given you. That's why God has provided protection in the form of armor. If you read Ephesians 6, 13 to 17, the whole armor we are invited to wear is described there. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. This can also be translated the moment, the hour. This is coming at us all the time. Stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, I love how he's like, ah, in case you didn't miss the point, stand, and then continue to stand, and then you're gonna have to keep on standing, Keep standing your ground in the vision. Stand firm then. Are you getting the point, Paul says? Stand with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And there's more. And you can find it in Ephesians chapter six in addition to all this take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god god has provided all of this to safeguard our guard our minds and hearts so that we can stand strong in the vision that god has given us in ezra chapter 4 verses 6 to 23 there's a very interesting section that then just gets put right here. Somewhat surprisingly, this next section moves quickly to another historical era after the temple was rebuilt. Verse six says that there's an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. It was raised at the beginning of the reign of Ahasuerus, but there's no further details mentioned about the opposition 
But this name is the Hebrew form of the Persian name better known for its Greek form, Xerxes. Xerxes the first ruled over the Persian Empire from 486 through 465 BC. So in other words, this flashback, all within Ezra chapter 4, Ezra chapter 4, 6 to 23, is 30 years after the temple was rebuilt. So it's like in a movie when you're flashing back or flashing forward and you're talking right about this story and then you flash forward. This is 30 years flash forward to when the temple is built and there is more opposition. It's like telling us there's always going to be opposition. Right now it's about the temple being rebuilt, but then in this next section, it's about when the temple was built and it's about the wall being rebuilt. The story of what's happening right then is that those rising up in opposition write a letter of slander to the Jews, about the Jews, to the king, and the threat in their report is very simple. If you allow the Jews to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, they won't pay you taxes and you'll lose your authority in the area. They are seeking to motivate Artaxerxes through the loss of money and power so that he will stop what the Jews were wanting to do right then. It's so classic, it's the political maneuverings. But this is exactly what they're facing 30 years after the temple is built. And so he comes with a strong arm and he forces things to stop in the rebuilding of the wall. Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2, we find Nehemiah pleading on behalf of his people, and this is likely the backstory, so we understand why he needed to go and plead in this way. Why is this stuck here? Why is this put right here, a flash forward 30 years later? Well, I think it's to show us opposition will always come. Opposition came in the building of the temple. Opposition came in the rebuilding of the wall. Opposition to the vision of God comes in our lives. And it gives us the backstory of what Nehemiah was facing so we understand why he was going and why he was pleading in these ways. 16 years lay between Ezra chapter 3 when they lay the foundation and resuming construction in Ezra chapter 5. And then we have this little flash forward for 30 years later that shows that the people of God face opposition again. Ezra and Nehemiah don't tell the whole story of why what was happening when the temple work stopped. The prophet Haggai fills in the blanks for us. So let's look. Haggai 1, 3, and 4, it tells us just what the people of God were doing during that time. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? So think about this. They had this beautiful ceremony. They laid the foundation. They built the altar. They had this moment of praise to God, and then opposition arises because where there is vision, plan on opposition, and the people of God, instead of moving forward with the vision God gave them, they're like, ah, and they start building their own houses. They start building their own houses and space. So for 16 years, the, the altar and the foundation lay unfinished. And the people of God, because of the opposition and the political nature and the fear of what they're facing, they go about building their own homes and their own market and their place where they live. And so God brings them back to the vision that God had called them to. Can we imagine how this could happen? With threats of harassment and opposition, how the people of God could just fall away, turn away from the work God had given them to do. There will be opposition to whatever God has given you, whatever God has put on your heart. And this chapter shows us two instances of opposition separated by 30 years. What will we do with opposition? The only way is through. The only way is through the struggle. Instead of moving around it or trying to just stop, there will be opposition with whatever the dream is that God put on your heart. There will be opposition. What will you do with it? What will you do with that resistance? Like the mom who labors and on the other side of either labor or a cesarean, 
She holds the joy in her arms of what she labored for, holding that baby and feeling the sweetness of that life. What will you push through to get to the joy on the other side? In closing, Dr. Kimberly Patton at the Harvard Divinity School has been asked a lot of questions about what do we do with resume gaps because those are happening more and more frequently. What do I do with the 10 years or two years or one year, these gaps in my resume? She said people feel uneasy and fretful about what it will look like to represent themselves on paper when they've had these gaps in their real life. How do I justify these times? This describes so much of, of what many of us feel right now. These 16 years that the people of God are, for some, these two years, some have said COVID just really threw me off and I haven't gotten back yet. But the people of God face these 16 years interruption in the vision that God gave them. So Dr. Patton's advice to her students, she says this, tell the truth. Say, I took in a child whose mother was in prison and sang her to sleep every night while she cried. I worked the night shift in a rifle factory. I battled an addiction and I won. My marriage made in heaven turned to hell. I fled to Chalcedonia. I fled to Paraguay. I lived in a monastery in Thailand where I came to see that all things, all things are empty and undeserving of our outrageous attachment to them. I swapped dirty needles for clean. I took photos of skulls left by the Khmer Rouge. I cut down trees all day and made them into tables. She goes on and on with story after story. Whatever it is, own that story. Own that story and get back into the vision that you have been called to for your life. Whatever it is, speak what happened and then move forward with the vision because wherever there is vision, there will be opposition. She says, how can we learn to not panic when our lives go off script and to say yes to getting back to where we're called to be? That's what the people of God needed to remember, that when we get the unexpected diagnosis, when we get the painful job loss, when we meet the resistance from family we thought would support us, when there's failure where we were expecting success, when there's arguments and struggle where we thought there would be peace and harmony, what do we do with that opposition? Keep the vision clear. Wherever there is vision, there will be opposition. And I close with this quote from This Day with God by Ellen White. She says, the opposition which you meet may prove an advantage to you in many respects. The forest tree which stands alone and exposed to the fierce winds and storm and tempest will not be uprooted by the gale, but will strike its roots deep and spread out its branches in every direction, becoming more beautiful and strong as the consequence of its withstanding storm and tempest. This may be your case. You may be deprived of sympathy and human support. You may feel that your only hope is to reach up your hands in supplication to God and hang your helpless soul upon your Redeemer. Help which heaven sends will be just what you need. I love this picture. That when you have a vision from God, you can expect opposition, but it could be that very opposition that caused your roots to go deep and the branches to go out so that you are able to bear the fruit which God has planned for your life. Friends, what will you do with the opposition to the vision God has given you? I'm Pastor Tara Van Cross, and we're so glad that you've tuned into our Azure Hills Church YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe, and click on the bell so that you'll be notified every time we share new videos. We are so glad that you're here. Until next time, please know that we're praying for you as you continue to be a voice of hope.